the eyes of the nation turned to Virginia. Let me tell you, it is great to be back in Roanoke. Friends, this is the moment. It's going to sweep across this great commonwealth. As their governor's race becomes a referendum on America, from education to race to crime to the economy to COVID. You can, no question, you can feel the enthusiasm and the energy in the crowd. How much of that is enthusiasm for you? How much is anger at Joe Biden's policies? Well, I like to think it's enthusiasm for me. Leland Vitter, News Nation. Nice to see you, sir. Biden plus 10 state, why is this even close? Always going to be close if you know the history of this state. Up close and personal with Republican businessman Glenn Youngkin, longtime Democratic powerhouse Terry McAuliffe, and Virginia voters. Why McAuliffe? Well, because he's not Trump. Is there anything about McAuliffe's policies you really like? I was not crazy about him last time, but I'm voting for him this time. If Glenn Youngkin wins in Virginia, it proves what? I think it's going to be a referendum on what's taken place in Virginia the last couple of years and also what's going on in, in our nation's county. Plus, Mike Allen, founder of Axios, political analyst Chris Steyerwald, Donald Trump confidant Matt Schlapp, and Kelly Meyer with early voting data. On election eve, it's a toss-up. Good evening from the University of Richmond. I'm Leland Vitter. If Glenn Youngkin wins tomorrow, it will be the biggest political upset since Donald Trump's victory in 2016. On September 1st, McAuliffe led Youngkin in the Real Clear Politics poll average by 5.2%. The race flipped a few days ago. Youngkin now leads by 1.7%. But off, off year elections are notoriously difficult to poll. Perhaps the most important poll is one that shows education, not the economy, not COVID, is the number one issue on voters' minds. We're going to delve into what that means in a minute. Angry school board meetings in Northern Virginia over critical race theory and transgender bathrooms began in late August. And the inflection point came in late September during a debate about schools and critical race theory when McAuliffe said this. Yeah, I, parents, you stopped the bill that I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. That put McAuliffe on the defensive, and he has been there ever since, arguing that a vote for Glenn Youngkin is a vote for Donald Trump, who is deeply unpopular with suburban women, especially those in the northern Virginian suburbs. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Trump. Donald Trump. 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 Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. You can tell an awful lot about a race by where the candidates are making their closing arguments in the hours before the polls open. Glenn Youngkin is in Loudoun County, Virginia, 30 minutes from D.C., where the education issue exploded. And Terry McAuliffe is in Fairfax County, which President Biden won by 40 points. Kelly Meyer is there a, as well. A few days ago, McAuliffe said this race isn't about Donald Trump. Kelly, I talked to him today. He said dozens of times Donald Trump in a single interview. So which is it? Leland, McAuliffe is towing a fine line between tying his opponent to the former president and keeping this race Virginia-centric. He told you earlier, Leland, that this race is about Virginia and Virginians, but he also is giving his opponent names like Glenn Trumpkin, and here's why. He's really trying to drum up support in areas like this one, Fairfax, that President Biden won over former President Trump this time last year. He's hoping that will bring him to a victory tomorrow. I am running against someone who has now been endorsed by Donald Trump 10 times. Glenn Youngkin's final campaign rally tonight. Guess who is headlining his rally tonight? Donald J. Trump. But Youngkin has distanced himself from the former president. He hasn't campaigned with him. That rally that Trump is hosting tonight, that virtual rally he's doing on his own. Uh, but the campaign with Youngkin, they weren't involved in that virtual rally at all. When I asked Youngkin why he wasn't teaming up with Trump, he said that this is about Virginians. A shockwave that says 
Virginians are standing up for all of America, for the values that we all hold true, and we are absolutely rejecting this left liberal progressive agenda that's trying to turn us into California East. We are saying no, no. Trump's virtual rally and Youngkin's Loudoun County rally will be happening around the same time here in just a little bit. All right, Kelly Meyer there with the McAuliffe campaign. We'll check back in when McAuliffe takes the stage. Thank you very much. Good to see you as well. We move on uh, now. For as much as Terry McAuliffe wishes this was about Donald Trump, for voters, the Virginia election is about the nine months of Joe Biden's presidency. That's what they told us when we talked to him. And if that isn't good... If you are a Democrat, that fact is not good. If you're a Democrat, Mike Allen of Axios writes, we're getting a clear verdict in public polls. America sees Biden similarly to the guy he beat, Donald Trump. Mike Allen, who got his start covering politics in the Commonwealth, now the founder of Axios, joins us now. Good to see you, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, is there a message from Democrats other than Yunkin equals Trump, Trump is bad, don't vote for Yunkin? Well, I can tell you, Elon, there's a big message coming from this race. And first of all, I'm jealous uh, down there with the University of Richmond Spiders. I lived for 10 years in Richmond, working for the Richmond Times-Dispatch, and uh, I've uh, enjoyed your coverage from across, across the Commonwealth. And, Leland, you put your finger on it in your lead-up piece. Life is about moments. Politics is about moments. And a lot of times in a race, we're saying, why did it turn? What happened? We'll say it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Not here. Here, there was a clear change in momentum in this race around that moment when, in tennis words, Terry McAuliffe said in a debate in late September that uh, parents shouldn't tell schools what to do. Now, if you watch the whole clip, a longer clip when he's talking about banning bugs, uh, it's much less controversial. But what happened right away? The young campaign seized on it, put in a spot, began using it relentlessly, and Terry McAuliffe didn't respond. And I talked to Democrats around the Commonwealth. They're very concerned. Democrats will tell you that Youngkin has big mo momentum tonight, and it's all about that moment, Leland. Yeah, you almost wonder if Terry McAuliffe could have it back, would he? Uh, you put this graphic at the very top of your Axios morning note, talking about Loudoun County. You called it ground zero. And the graphic shows the margin of victory in Virginia gubernatorial and presidential elections in Loudoun County. The spelling error is ours, not yours. Why is Loudoun ground zero? What does the graph tell us? Yeah, uh, so you mentioned it's about, uh, if it's uh, 30 miles, it's uh, 40 or 50 uh, uh, minutes outside D.C. Used to be very sleepy, but its population has doubled uh, uh, over the last uh, a decade or so. It's all about tech voters who've moved in. And the reason that we're watching that is two things. You gotta speak up. Like one is just the demogra demographic uh, patterns you'd watch uh, anyway. It's those... Uh, areas beyond the suburbs that make such a difference in statewide and national races. But also, and you hinted at this in your lead up package, it also has become ground zero in some of these school debates uh, on News Nation and elsewhere. We've seen the video from school board meetings, debates about masks, debate about instruction, about race. All of that has been happening in Loudoun. So, Leland, even if Lung Yunkin were to win, we expect him to be behind in Loudoun, but it's how much can he close that gap that you showed in that graphic. Democrats have been picking up a lot of steam in Loudoun. He's clearly stopped that. How much can we pull back? So tomorrow night, we'll be watching Loudoun, not only to see where the results are going, but also help to help explain the outcome. Yeah, you think about the suburban women who may not have liked Donald Trump's style, but also don't like critical race theory and transgender uh, bathrooms. Looming over all of this, Mike, and you've cut, touched on this so many times, is President Trump. Listen to what Glenn Youngkin had to say when I asked him about the former president. You said rightly that a lot of this energy is from anger about President Biden. If President Trump had won re-election in 2020 and was president today, would you have a chance in a Biden plus 10 state? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea. What I do know right now, what I do right know right now 
is we're watching something really special happen. And we're watching something special happen because, again, it, it, is, it is this spirit, and I talk about it, it's the spirit of Washington and Jefferson and Madison and Monroe, Patrick Henry, across this commonwealth. All right, Youngkin refuses to say President Trump's name. Uh, Mike, if Youngkin wins, despite not embracing Trump, does this prove that the emperor of the Republican Party has no clothes? What this showing is showing, Leland, is a new way for Republicans to win in a Trump universe. So there's no question that Donald Trump is going to be out there for a good long time. He's going to remain the most powerful person in the party. But you get a purple state like Virginia where you can't embrace him. So what are you going to do? Uh, Gwen Youngkin has found that formula on Saturday. One of my Axios DC colleagues was with Gwen Youngkin at a farmer's market up here in Alexandria, very blue state. It was very blue area. He was drew such a crowd that they'd fallen out into the street and were stopping traffic. Momentum you can't buy. And so what has he done? Exactly what you saw there. He didn't uh, even reference him. He just moved on to his little patriotic litany there. And Peggy Noonan in the Wall Street Journal captured this perfectly. She said the Yunkin formula, which other Republicans in uh, purple uh, states or tough states can use, is don't insult Donald Trump, but keep him as far away as possible. Glenn Youngkin has nailed that. And Leland, uh, another sign of uh, how this race looks, a statement today from former President Trump, obviously thinks Glenn Youngkin is going to win, saying nice things about Youngkin, clearly setting the table for being able to take credit for the yeah. win. So you had the unusual situation of Donald Trump sucking up to another Republican. You don't get that very often, Leland. Uh, that, that would be an understatement, my friend. Good to see you. We'll talk tomorrow night. Thanks for your coverage. That's Chuck Todd of NBC explaining the president's problems, and it is playing out here in Virginia. Listen to a little bit of my conversation with a diehard Democrat today at the Terry McAuliffe rally. If McAuliffe wins on Tuesday, why will it be? Why will it be? People have come out to vote. If McAuliffe loses, what will be the reason? People are fed up with uh, what's going on in the White House and that uh, Biden's numbers are down. They are down, almost mirror images, in fact. 53-39 approved of the president in April, now 54% disapprove. Kristen Soltis Anderson makes money polling people and then explaining the results to the rest of us. Joining us now, nice to see you. I want to break down this concept of education being the number one issue here. Are we to view education as what kind of math to teach, or is that a proxy for critical race theory, transgender bathrooms, masks, vaccines, and the like. There are so many issues that fall under the umbrella of education, and they range from issues around race. Uh, how do we teach about race in schools? It extends to things like there are some places in Virginia that had talked about getting rid of gifted and talented programs or admissions tests to get into certain magnet schools because they were viewed as not advancing racial equity in schools. But there's also a lot of parents who just have pent up frustration about the way the schools handled COVID-19. Maybe they're frustrated that their kids have to wear masks. They're frustrated that they're not getting clear information from schools about what's going on. And there's also, frankly, just generalized anxiety that our public schools aren't doing what they need to do to prepare kids for the future. And so you put all of that together and you wind up in my polling. If you ask voters in Virginia who they're voting for, people who are not parents of kids in K-12 schools actually break very slightly for Terry McAuliffe. But among K-12 parents, my polling shows they break for Youngkin by 15 points. This is an incredibly potent issue in this race. And it's valuable to Youngkin because it bridges those Republican base voters who might be fired up around something like critical race theory, as well as those suburban voters, the swing voters that used to be a big piece of the Republican coalition, maybe that's not what they're the most frustrated about, but they saw their kids do a year of school on Zoom. They didn't think it was that great, and they're frustrated that they want leadership to do something better in the future. Have we ever seen anything like what you just described about the difference between people who are parents and not parents, how they vote? 
Well, there are a, a number of, of different interesting divides that always happen in politics whenever a particular issue really pops. But education being so central isn't something that's happened in quite some time. Frankly, I'm, I'm struggling to think of anything in the last 20 years since George W. Bush ran for president and actually education was his big message back then. Whenever Republicans are able to capture the education issue, it usually works out very well for them, in part because it is normally an issue that favor Democrats. You know, you showed that great graphic that Chuck Todd had of their polling showing Republicans with advantages on all of these big issues and not just the ones that Republicans normally win, like border security or national security, but also the economy, inflation. Those are normally a little more evenly divided. And education is normally right there with health care as an issue that Democrats dominate. The fact that they have lost that dominance in Virginia and ceded that ground to Yunkin has really made Democrats vulnerable in places where they shouldn't necessarily be. Yeah, stunning to think, as you pointed out, not since George W. Bush 2000. Uh, Kristen Soltis Anderson, awesome analysis. We appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, how Biden's domestic agenda is causing problems for Democrat Terry McAuliffe. The president's overseas. We'll check in when we come back. We're running a presidential level turnout operation. We keep hearing about anger about President Biden's just really killing you. You even said it. Yeah, but listen, tomorrow, it's, it's it's about Virginia. It's about what I'm proposing to do. It's what these two are proposing to do. That's what really this election. But let's be honest. I do want to thank the president and for the American Rescue Plan. We got $14.3 billion here in Virginia. We got $300 million for education with the American Rescue Plan. And I guess I'm pretty confident. I hope that tomorrow they're going to pass an infrastructure bill. Get your job done. Pass the The bill. confidence by Terry McAuliffe. The progress on Capitol Hill would show Democrats could get something done was perhaps ill-placed. In the past few hours, Democratic West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin took a nuclear bomb to President Biden's domestic agenda. Infrastructure possibly dead, at least on pause. Free parental leave, forget about it. Child tax credits, we'll see on and on. Same for the president's $500 billion in climate spending. And it could not come at a worse time for the White House. Right now, President Biden is overseas, and his trip to Rome and Scotland has yielded very little, if anything, in the way of victories. Right now, the president's trying to negotiate a massive deal with world leaders to curb emissions and thus, in his words, save the planet. Niall Standage, columnist for The Hill, our sister company, with us now from D.C. Niall, uh, good to see you. Is there a contingency plan by the White House to get President Biden a win, any win, sometime? Well, this is made much more difficult by those remarks from Senator Manchin that you mentioned. There are two competing things here, Leland. There's the domestic agenda, which is obviously imperiled by these democratic divisions. And there's the overseas trip at which the uh, aspirations have been just that. They have been rather vague things that might happen or that we hope happen rather than being particularly concrete. We have to take a look at this from earlier today with the president. A number of reporters remarked that the president appeared to fall asleep uh, during the climate conference. Perhaps one can't blame somebody for being jet lagged and falling asleep <laughs> at a climate crisis. But is that in some way sort of a metaphor for what's going to come out of this? It's, it's relatively sleepy. It's hard to get middle America fired up about we made a deal to curb emissions 10 years from now. But by the way, China and Russia aren't doing anything. Yeah, I think it's very difficult to get middle America fired up about foreign affairs generally, but particularly when it's something as long-standing as climate change. It is an issue that matters to young voters, but the kind of thing that we're hearing here is pretty vague or pretty minor. It's things like countries will commit themselves not to fund coal-powered coal power plants in other nations. That's not going to get anybody terribly excited. Now, as for President Biden, I mean, who among us hasn't felt like nodding off during a speech at some point? I think he might get a bit of a pass on that. But I take your point that overall, it's a bit of a sleepy uh, endeavor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's been plenty of conferences you're sitting there uh, falling asleep. But I agree with you on the uh, give them a pass on that. As you talk to the White House, how closely are they watching Virginia? Or do they feel like 
we sent the president there, the vice president there. We've done enough and let the chips fall where they may. I think they're trying to put a brave face on it for the moment, Leland, but I think they are watching it very closely. If Terry McAuliffe were to lose Virginia, a state that President Biden carried by 10 points last year, that would be very bad news, not just because it would speak to President Biden's eroding poll ratings, but because it would have a whole cascade of damaging effects. It would make Democrats more likely to retire from the House. It would mean Republicans were on course to take control control of Congress next year. And it would even make it more difficult for President Biden to corral Democrats to his agenda. So whatever the White House may say publicly, they're keeping a very close eye on what happens. You think about it, Terry McAuliffe ran on this woke world agenda. Just recently, he was talking about how one of the real problems in Virginia is there's too many white teachers, um, which, which might work tomorrow. It might prove to be a real problem for him tomorrow. Has there been any contingency planning by the White House to tack more to the center if McAuliffe loses to try to save the Democrats in the midterms you just talked about? President Biden has generally tried to not get too far down the road of so-called woke rhetoric. But I, I was at a, a Yunkin event at the weekend and I was speaking to audience members there and they were really energized by this sense of, of the cultural issues, of the idea that there was a sort of a left-wing um, effort to change American culture. That, I think, is a really animating issue, particularly among more conservative-leaning Americans, and we really are going to see in Virginia tomorrow the first sign of how that plays out electorally. I think it's going to be fascinating to see how this election goes uh, through that particular prism. Yeah, you said the same word that I said when I walked out of a Yunkin rally, which was energy, and you walked out of a Terry McAuliffe rally, at least I did earlier today, and came away with uh, sleepy is probably the primary adjective. Niall, good chat and thank you, my friend. Excellent analysis. Thanks, Massive change from last year. Speaking of cu cultural issues, local elections now center around crime and public safety. Why defund the police candidates are having a hard time this year around. If it's about Virginia, why has this become a national race? Because my opponent doesn't know how to talk about Virginia. And all he does is try to bring people in from outside Virginia. Now, the other reason why it's a national race is because there's only two statewide races this year, and a Republican is getting ready to take back the Commonwealth of Virginia that we lost by 10 points last time. More of Glenn Youngkins in my conversation last night. Virginia might be the most important election nationally. But tomorrow, there is a stunning trend that we're going to need to look at in mayor's races across the country. Big Democratic cities are now focusing on the issue of crime. The Washington Post writes, in a setback for Black Lives Matter, mayoral campaigns shift to law and order across the country. Local candidates are pitching themselves as advocates on safety and supporters of the police. Nowhere is that more apparent than in Minneapolis. Ground zero for the defund the police movement after the George Floyd murder. Tomorrow, voters in Minneapolis are going to decide if they want to eliminate the police department altogether in that city. Kelsey Kernstein is live in Minneapolis tonight. Kelsey, good evening. Good evening, Lizan. Well, come uh, Wednesday morning, it will all come down to if progressives get their way, that uh, uh, if they actually decide that there won't be a Minneapolis Police Department come Wednesday morning. And residents, they say, they tell me that they are terrified considering the violence that they have seen over the last 18 months since the killing of George Floyd. Now, take a look at this full screen. Violent crime in Minneapolis is up by 30%. Police, police force is down by 30%. Officers quitting, retiring, going on disability leave due to post-traumatic stress disorder. And tomorrow, residents will take the poll to decide whether or not to get rid of the Minneapolis Police Department. I think they need to keep the police officers. You have a few bad apples in the bunch, but not all of them are bad. I think if you get rid of them, it's going to become a wild, wild west down here. 
And if the measure passes, the Minneapolis Police Department will be replaced with the Department of Public Safety. This is essentially a comprehensive public health approach. And how it will work in practice is just not exactly clear. But across the nation, the murder rate is up by 30% from 2019 to 2020. That's a single year highest jump since the 1960s. And law and order is really dominating the polls across at least seven cities right now. In Atlanta, murder is up by 58% from 2019 to 2020. 14 candidates are vying for the mayor position. Former mayor is trying to get his job back by hiring 750 new officers if he gets a position. And in Seattle, police force is down as well. 73% of homicides are up from 2019 to 2020. And top two mayor position mayors, they're pushing for various police reforms. But back here, Leland in Minneapolis, defund the police movement has been here for the last 18 months. I tried to go live earlier by the George Floyd Memorial site, but it's just too dangerous due to the sporadic gunfire in the area, Leland. Kelsey Kernstein in Minneapolis, we're glad you're safe. Thank you. Biden plus 10 state, why is this even close? Always going to be close if you know the history of this state, because it's off here. It's not a presidential, obviously presidential turnout. And I also got to remind you, for 44 years, the party that wins the White House, the next year the other party wins the governor's mansion. I'm the only guy to break it. I won in 13, of course, President Obama won in 12. There's a little bit more of my conversation with Terry McAuliffe from today in southern Virginia, Roanoke to be specific. With that, welcome back to the University of Richmond, having interviewed Mr. McAuliffe, Governor McAuliffe before, I can say it's a very different, the Mac, than the usually relaxed, jovial version known for his fundraising prowess during the Clinton years. He's had the money and certainly the organization, but as we've said right now, he does not have the big mo, the momentum going into election day tomorrow. A man who always has the mo, Chris Steyerwalt, longtime political reporter and columnist joining us from the nation's capital. Uh, let's look forward, Chris. If Glenn Youngkin wins, uh, where does the Republican Governors Association look forward to in 2022? Well, the Republicans did pretty well. Uh, on, uh, they haven't struggled there. That hasn't been their problem. And as a matter of fact, uh, the ability of governors, Republicans, to hold on to the gubernatorial level, and I don't believe they lost a, state, a single state house or even maybe a chamber of a state house in 2020, even as Donald Trump lost. So they've remained strong on that level. And part of the way that they have remained strong has been by having candidates that match the state, right? So Maryland, uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts has a Republican governor. Uh, they don't have a. They don't have the same kind of governor they'd elect in Alabama, but they have a Republican governor, and that's really what it comes down to. Politics is very nationalized now. That's that's true, uh, and I've I've long talked about that as the, the 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 dominant truth of American political life today. All these issues become national, but you've got to tailor to your state, and you've got to tailor to the issue set in your state. And the Republicans chose really wisely in Virginia with Glenn Youngkin, uh, who a lot of people didn't give a chance starting out. Yeah, he used to make this joke on the trail. He made it with us last night that when he started. Uh, his name ID was 2%, and the poll had a margin of error of 3%. So uh, the, the, you can see where he has come since then, now a household name nationally. You want to talk about tailoring to issues. Number one issue, and we've said this in the Virginia governor's race, is education. Kristen Soltis Anderson says that hasn't been the case since 2000. And you got to look really as education is this proxy for so many other things. Uh, does that prove true, and is that a pathway for Republicans in 2022, or is this lightning in a bottle? So it is uh, certainly true that there are some subliminal messages, or not subliminal, but there are some Soto voice mentions when Youngkin is talking about education. Yes, there is critical race theory. Yes, there is the culture war stuff. Yes, there are those components, certainly that help him connect to voters in Western uh, and Southern Virginia that are maybe suspicious of a more Mitt Romneyite kind of candidate who prefer a more Donald Trumpy kind of candidate. But here is what makes it, when we talk about the education issue in Virginia now and in midterm, next year, we're talking about coronavirus. 
and we're talking about the teachers unions. The, Terry McAuliffe's in a, in a dreadful position on this. He relies on the teachers union to get out the vote for support. He relies on those unions for contributions for all of that that he needs. It is really the back, government worker unions are the backbone of the Democratic Party in Virginia and in most states. So what happens when parents are incredibly frustrated with the terrible job that schools did educating kids in Virginia in 2020 and how long they stayed shut down, how many families were really suffering under this, and they see the Democratic Party as beholden to these teachers unions and unwilling to confront them about poor performance and their failure during coronavirus. That puts McAuliffe between the Democratic-leaning families, moms and dads of Northern Virginia, and the teachers union that are part of the backbone of his operation. That's a tough spot to be in. Yeah, and McAuliffe clearly chose the teachers unions because after his gaffe, if you will, or admission saying that parents shouldn't be involved, he's now turned to saying, oh, no, I, I believe in the teachers, I believe in the teachers, and sort of ignoring the parents. You make a great point, though, in that the backbone of the Democratic Party has also really come out for Terry McAuliffe. Youngkin has said, I'm going this alone. Listen to McAuliffe talk about who showed up here in Virginia over the past couple of weeks. We've had great surrogates. I was very proud to have President Obama, President Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, Stacey Abrams, Dave Matthews, Pharrell. I'll take my uh, surrogates over Donald Trump any day of the week. Is he going to come to regret if he loses having had President Biden and President Obama show up so much? No, you can't keep them away. It's worse if they don't come. Donald Trump's not coming is a story, right? And especially if the sitting president doesn't come, then it's a problem. Well, what's the deal here? And there are some voters who connect to Biden. There's certainly a lot of voters in Virginia that connect to uh, Barack Obama. Stacey Abrams is a little more problematic, but this we can also look at the other side of this coin. The best news for Glenn Youngkin is that no one is coming. Right, the best because there are no Republicans other than the in-state Republicans. Right, he could have uh, former Governor Bob McDonald, maybe yeah. he could have uh, those guys, but there's no national Republican who could help him in Virginia, and that speaks to what's the the, the state of the red team in Virginia these days, and how Youngkin has to run as a one-off, like governors in Republicans in Maryland or uh, Michigan uh, or in uh, Massachusetts. Yeah, you talk about how unique uh, Virginia is. Speaking of the story of President Trump not coming, we're heading there next. Chris, thank you. You bet. Trump, Donald Trump, 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 Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, 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 Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, 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 All right, that was Glenn Youngkin's ad. For obvious reasons, Terry McAuliffe wishes this election was a referendum on President Trump rather than on the current president, Joe Biden. But his opponent, Glenn Youngkin, isn't playing along. He has never held a rally with President Trump and, moreover, never mentions Trump by name, even when asked. I know this because I've asked. We visited Washington County, Virginia, along the Tennessee border, where President Trump got more than 75% of the vote to see if that's okay with diehard Trump supporters. Glenn Youngkin hasn't wrapped himself in the MAGA flag. Does that bother anybody? No. Uh, no. Not really. But this is Trump country for sure. Oh, yeah. We need a leader in this state, not a follower. And if that man can stand up like the leader of our president of the United States can do, we don't want him following. We want him leading. And you think Youngkin can lead in his own way? I think so, yes. Hmm. Youngkin's tightrope of embracing MAGA voters, but not necessarily the MAGA ideology, is clearly working. For what that means and why, we bring in Trump confidant Matt Schlapp, chairman of the Conservative Political Action Coalition. Matt, good to see you. We appreciate it. Uh, if Youngkin wins, does it prove the emperor of the Republican Party has no clothes? No, I, I think what it means is, is that these questions that we thought the election were going to be about, uh, it turned into something totally different. It turned into all these cultural questions. You know, kids were home during coronavirus. I agree with 
Chris Dyerwalt is a parent in Northern Virginia, and a lot of our neighbors were dumbfounded with how bad the public schools mismanaged that opportunity. And then they started to stumble across all of this agenda of critical race theory, this uh, sexualizing young children, the war on gender, just absolute radical stuff that parents didn't quite realize was in the curriculum of these schools in Loudoun County, a county that's really was a Republican bellwether, but has really turned into more of a Democratic county due to a lot of Soros money and such. You know, this has just completely changed the landscape of the race. And Glenn Youngkin probably didn't think he'd be a cultural warrior as a Republican nominee, but that's what he's become. Yeah, there's no question. It's pretty interesting when you think about Loudoun County, one of the wealthiest counties in the country, uh, now conceivably, possibly trending all the way back red or at least at least getting to 50-50. Uh, let's take this the other way. If Democrats are successful making this about President Trump and Terry McAuliffe wins, does that prove that in 2022 any Republican candidate must go full MAGA? Uh, you know, I just think it's kind of simple. It's a blue state where Joe Biden is underwater by most polls show him as much as 10 points unpopular in the state. So I understand I'm a Republican and you want to focus on where Donald Trump is in the state. But the assumption is that Donald Trump wouldn't be popular in a blue state. And actually what we're seeing is on the issues, uh, they match where Donald Trump uh, goes when it comes to questions about parents and kids and do parents have a role in teaching their kids. So I guess this question is, does Trump get any credit if Youngkin wins? I sure think he will. Will Trump be blamed if a Youngkin loses? I guess all I would say is the expectation is the Republicans gonna lose in Virginia. Let me just tell you this, if Youngkin wins, this is like a Scott Brown victory in Massachusetts. This is going to be, uh, this, is, this is just like a, a massive statement heading into next year's election. All right, I only got about 30 seconds. Massive statement. That statement says, that statement, we know what it says, Republicans can win in a Biden plus 10 state. What does that statement mean practically? It means that Democrats will start to continue to move away from Joe Biden. You already saw Kristen Sinema and Joe Manchin on the budget deal. You'll see more Democrats realizing that they're going to have to go it alone to win their race, that standing by the president and standing by these more radicalized policies aren't good in a purple area. So I think that'll actually be good for the country. Maybe a little more centrist uh, Democrats would be good for all of us. Yeah. Matt, uh, excellent both local uh, Virginia voters perspective and national as well. It's always good to see you. Thank you. There are some who still contest the 2020 presidential election. Will the loser of this race follow suit? That when we come back. All right, that's Glenn Youngkin right there talking last night about possible challenges to tomorrow's election results. However, former President Trump saw it slightly differently. Here's his statement from today saying in part, I'm not a believer in the integrity of Virginia's elections. Lots of bad things went on and are going on. The way you beat it is to flood the system and get out the vote. With that, we bring in a couple of professors from our wonderful hosts here. President Biden won Virginia by 10 points last year. It is not exactly a focus of Mr. Trump's elections conspiracies. Tomorrow's race will almost certainly be a lot closer. From the University of Virginia, gentlemen, glad to have you. Professor of Law, Hank Chambers, Dan Palazzo, Palazzo of Political Science Department. Nice to see you, gentlemen. Uh, all right, Counselor, how big does the margin have to be before everyone says, we're just going to go home? For most situations, the margin can actually be fairly small because we know how to count in Virginia. So even if it's relatively close within, say, a percent or so, still that's going to be a large enough amount for folks to say, OK, the winner won and the loser lost. If it's less than a half percent, then other kind of requirements kick in. But anything more than a half a percent, for example, and folks are going to say, go, go ahead, recount it. That is, count it one more time, make sure and go ahead and, and the winner won and the loser lost. That's how we do it in Virginia. All right. It's a Biden plus 10 state. Uh, Dan, are we going to get within a half a percent or is it going to be more uh, overwhelming than that? 
I think the voters are going to have to decide that, but what we know is that this is going to be a close race. I mean, party, parties and issues and candidates always decide elections. The Democrats have the advantage in terms of party, but the Republicans have the advantage in terms of issues and candidate factors this time. Certainly in terms of momentum. Are you surprised how election integrity has played into this race or has not? I'm not terribly surprised that folks have raised the issue, but like we say, at the end of the day, we're going to count the votes. Whoever wins, we wins. counted them in 2020, and not everybody accepted it there either. So why is Virginia different in your mind? Well, part of it is that, that we just have a history of counting correctly. So what's going to happen in Virginia is, and it's also just a state as opposed to multiple states, things along those lines. We also have rules that we follow. We follow them pretty strictly, and as a consequence, once you're done with the election, you're done with the election. We shake hands, we say congratulations, and if you lost, you lost. If you won, you won. As they say, well. I'll just leave it at that. If you won, you won. If you lost, you lost. <laughs> Dan, what do you make of where we're at uh, right now? You're, you're at the center of this in the state. Did anybody see these tectonic plates shifting in education in Virginia that becoming a key issue that the national media just missed? I think the education issue was always there, kind of grew out of the General Assembly session, but it didn't really become a political issue until later in the campaign. And I think some of the, the comments that, uh, that McAuliffe made really kind of inflamed the issue, and Youngkin took advantage of that. If, how, how late of a night is tomorrow night going to be? It, it ought to be relatively early, I think. And I say that because there's been a fair amount of early voting and because our machines are pretty pretty good, pretty strong. So we're, we're usually pretty good at getting the vote in. So we're not going to have to have you back tomorrow is what you're saying. Well, if you, want me, if you want me back, I'm happy to come back. <laughs> no, but realistically, you don't see this being contested. No. No, I, I don't see it being contested. You know, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. That's what we all learned when we were kids, and that's the way it goes now. Some, some people uh, learned that. Perhaps we found that others uh, did not. Uh, we want to thank the University of Richmond, gentlemen. Thank you for being our hosts. Professors, nice to see you as well. And I know it's a lot, lot of things to talk about with the classes, the boys and girls over the coming days. Thank you both. We appreciate it. Sure. We move back. Vince Lombardi once said, that's why you play the game. In fact, I think that's what you said as well. In applies in sports and politics as well. For all the polling, punditry, and politicking tomorrow, the voters get to tell us if we got it right. Dan Abrams is next. We're going to see you from Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, as the votes come in tomorrow night. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.